Okay. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, it sounds fine. Okay. Well, I'm going to kind of continue on with what we were looking at uh, last time. And that was this uh, some new code that I had written called one wire. There's a transmit and a receive. So I thought we'd just kind of look at those. This is new code that's actually going into, it'll be going into Mercury, Penny, and Ozzy. And um, we're just starting to test it right now. In fact, I've got my radio running with it right now. Let's see if it's, I think it's on. Oh, well, if they had anything. I had it tuned to a local station. <laughs> So uh, yeah, it's working right now. <laughs> anyway, um, for those of you that might not have uh, listened to the last lecture yet, part of it, let's uh, take a look at some of this code and some of the different uh, Verilog things that you might do. All right, this particular one wire module, I call it, this is a one wire transmit. Can everybody see this okay? Is it clear enough on your screen? Yep. Okay. So here we have a module and it has um, one, two, three, four different um, connections. Okay, a reset, a clock, the data that we want to transmit, and a single bit uh, called D out of data that we want to send to another board across one of the atlas lines. And I call this a parameterized module. And the reason is, is I have parameters in this particular module. And as you know, parameters can be overridden from outside the module from another module. So here I have some values that have um, certain default values, like clock frequency 48 megahertz, which when, if I were to put this in Aussie, that it has a uh, IF clock that runs at 48 megahertz, so I wouldn't have to change this. And the data bits, you can see us set at 64. In the real case, I override this because we're only transmitting 59. But the nice thing is, is this module is written in such a way that if I change these values, the rest of the code will work for those values. So. One of the ways in which I do that is, let's say that I had a, let's say I was going to make a counter, and I was going to, I needed to be able to count for 16, I need to be able to make it count 16 times. So typically in a counter, I go from 0 to 15. So how do you determine how many bits, how wide of a register, we're going to make a register, how many bits wide of a register do you make? in order to hold a value that only goes between 0 and 15. In other words, 16 minus 1. 0 to 16 minus 1. How do you determine that? Anybody want to answer? Well, there's one way that you can do it, and that is you uh, take the maximum value, the 16 minus 1, which is 15. Well, what is 15? in base 2. It would be 1, 1, 1, 1. So you'd have four ones, right? So that would be the biggest value. Okay, so if you've got four ones and the rest of everything beyond that is zero, the, then you know you only need four bits to hold that value. Well, how could you calculate what size you need? Well, that's where this little function I made up here comes in. And basically, you, you give it the maximum value that you're going to use, and it's going to take that and just imagine it as 1111. Let's say it was just four bits wide, 1111. And it goes through a loop, and each time it goes through the loop, it shifts the value right. Okay? So if you shift the 111 right, then you get three ones. And then the next time you'll get two ones. And then the next time you'll get just a single one. And in the next loop, it'll go to zero because you've shifted it right by one bit each time. So it took us four loops to get that value shifted down to zero. So that's, that's what tells us that we need something that's four bits wide. Well, I can make a function. And functions are good for doing calculations like that. So that's what this function I called C log base 2, C log B2, 
That's all it does. It just sits there and determines how many bits I need for a, for a particular value. So I like to use this little function, and I'll show you how I use that function. It's really good when you're making parameterized modules. So let's say that I had, well, in this case, data bits is 64. So let's say I was going to make a counter that went from that needed to loop 64 times. Well, I could go from 0 to 64 minus 1, or 63. So if I take that, uh, where is data bits? Oh, here we go. Here I've fed data bits minus 1, which is 63. And it'll come back, that function, now this is at compile time. This is not run time. This is just a compile time. It'll calculate this value, xs, based on what data bits is. So if data bits is 64, I get 64 minus 1, that's 63. It'll determine that I need 6 bits. And so XS is 6 bits now. Well, that's nice, because now, if I take that XS, I can go down here, and I can make my counter that I want to go from 0 to data bits minus 1. I know how wide I need it now. I know that it's 6 bits. Well, so I go from 0 to XS minus 1, which is 0 to 5, so that's 6 bits. Okay, now if I change data bits, it'll automatically recalculate it for me. Okay, now if I were to put in a value of change this to 59, it's still going to need 6 bits. And if you go through the exercise, you would see that you'd still get 6 bits. So that's what, that's what these, fu these functions are right here, these CLogB2 are doing. They're just calculating how many bits I need for a particular register for something that I'm going to do. Okay. Now in this case, I actually need this register to go from 0 to data bits minus 1. Okay, so you can use it directly if you wanted to. But sometimes you might just need to know um, this type of information, and you can calculate that with a function. And you can make your own functions. So here I've calculated some values in this particular um, one wire logic. Basically, the way this works, we'll go through this again, is after we reset, there's a delay time, and I specify that as one of the parameters in milliseconds. Okay. Then I feed it um, some sync bits, five, five logic zeros. So that's what these are. This is a, from here to here is a logic zero. And from here to here, that's a logic zero. And here's what the logic zero and one look like. So for a logic zero, the first quarter of the cycle is high, and the rest of the cycle is low. For logic one, the first three quarters are high, and the last one is low. So you notice the nice thing about this is it's what we would call self-clocking. You don't need a clock. Um, in other words, the rising every time you have a rising edge from this rising edge to this rising edge, that's one data bit. We know that that data bit is contained within that time frame. So the receiver can actually um, say it's running on a on a different clock. It can count clocks from the beginning of this edge to the beginning of this edge, and it could say, "Oh, okay, it takes me 300 clocks, let's say, for this time period, TB." Well, if I take that and divide it by 2 and, and, and then sample the data at halfway through this thing, I should know whether it's a logic 1 or a logic 0. So that's kind of how this works. Kirk, uh, yes. is there a reason you made the data bit two kind of time periods long instead of one, so that it was uh, you know a total of three bits long instead of four as you've designed it? Right here? Yes. Yeah. The, the reason the last quarter is low is because I want to have a rising edge at the end of the time period. Uh, I understand that, but you've only got one data bit that takes up two clock periods. Two clock periods. Where you've periods. kind of designed it so that, you know, the, 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 the clock is, is always uh, uh, the leading clock bit is, is one long. I guess what the question is, why couldn't the data bit be one period long instead of two as you've designed it? Is there, you know, any particular reason? Um, no, it just gives me a little more margin here because if I sample in the middle, I've got some margin either side of this. You, this is just okay. the way. This is just the way I made it. You can make it completely different. 
and and in this particular case, the reason I did it is it gives me margin, and th this transmission is not a very fast transmission. I may be only doing this a typically maybe a thousand times a second, a string of data, and I'll show you the string of data, 59 bits, I think it is for the current version. So yeah, you could you could make up your own. I just made this up the other day. So this is just comment. This is just one way that you could do it. Uh, Kirk, this is Joe. Um, what's really kind of slick about the way you did this is you can apply this to any board that has any kind of a clock frequency on it, as long as that clock frequency is higher than what you know what the individual uh, time elements are here. Like you said, it, one one interval might involve 300 clocks cycles on the board that you actually send this thing to so that that's what's slick about it 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 can it can be sent to any kind of a board and be self clocking yes that was the purpose in doing it and that way we only needed one signal wire so um, what we're using it for right now what we're testing is mercury has one of these one wire transmitters in it and what it does is it'll send out the serial number of the board and um, I think there's some like ADC overload it's going to send that and it can string that send that information out on this one wire back to Ozzy and then Ozzy can use the one wire receiver which will go over and receive that data so it, so Mercury can just sit there and transmit this information constantly and then Ozzy can pick it up and then on on Penny it can do a similar thing it can send out its serial number and any other data that it needs to send back to Ozzy and we just need the one wire and then on Ozzy, it can use a trans one of these transmitters, and it can send a whole lot of different information to all the boards, and they can all sit there and listen and pick off the information that they want. So that's where the 59, Ozzy's sending out like 59 bits of information. Uh, let's see if I can pull it up. Um, I think this is the latest one I have right now. Um, okay, here we go. In, scroll up here. This is in the Aussie FPGA. And so I've defined this transmit data as all these different things. There's uh, PTT out and the an address, there's a frequency gets transmitted, and so this winds up, all of this information winds up to be 59 bits. And so here I've overridden that parameter with a value of 59, and then I fed it a reset, the clock, and this transmit data, and then which uh, pin that it's going to go out on, the one that I call command and control, whichever that happens to be on Atlas, which is uh, C20, I think, on Atlas right now. So that's all I have to do to send all that data out to everybody. So Penny looks at this particular line and it uses the one wire receiver and grabs the data from here and then it can just pick off the data that it needs out of that uh, out of the data that it receives. Same thing for Mercury or anybody else that wants to listen to this. So let's go back. So basically I've made some calculations like Q1, I calculate based on the parameters that I've uh, got right here, I calculate how long or how many clocks it's going to take running at the frequency that's been specified and how many and what my, uh, repeat, my what I call my frame frequency. The frame frequency is basically okay I got 64 bits and I want to repeat that a thousand times a second. Okay, so this calculation just tells me how many clocks it's going to take to generate this Q1. And in Q1, I call this time period the first quarter of this cycle. So that's the amount of time it's going to take for the first quarter. So I've made some calculations here. This one is for the first three quarters, which is 3 times Q1, or for the whole cycle, be 4 times Q1. And then the low time would be. Uh, I've said I, for this low time here after the uh, sync bits, these sync bits get sent out initially after the delay time, and then they they get sent out once every second. 
so not real often. So you, you send these out, you send out this low for a greater than two bits of time, in which case I did it for four down here, four bits worth of time. And then, and then you send the 64 data bits, and then you just keep repeating those 64 data bits over and over <clears throat> for one second, basically. Okay, then those are, these are just variables that I'm using in this code. And this is for a, uh, these values are for my state machine. We'll talk more about that sometime. And these are all, um, this is all RTL code. Let's go down. So this whole, this whole always block here running on the positive edge of clock. Um, these all get turned into flip-flops, okay? D flip-flops typically within your FPGA or ASIC or whatever you're making. And then this is kind of the guts of my state machine. I'm going to tell you a little bit about state machines, even though we haven't talked about them yet. We'll go ahead and talk about them today a little bit here. This one's a little large. It'd be nice if I had something a little smaller to start off with, but. Okay, I have a uh, state machine, and basically the state machine consists of flip-flops. And let me go find how, how many in this case. Here it is. I say I have five flip-flops. Now, why do I say five? Well, that's because I have nine states. So in order to hold nine states, I need to have five flip-flops. So I can hold values from zero to eight because I have this many states that I want to use. And the state is merely just a binary combination on those five flip-flops, the outputs. So this is actually becomes the output of the flip-flops, uh, this OW state. And so you'll, on, that, on those outputs, you'll see values from 0 to 8. And how does this thing work? Well, in this always block, I have an at pause edge of the clock. Let's go down here. Here's the actual state machine. So I said, if we're in reset, then I want my state machine to go to idle. Okay, now the natural state for idle would be all zeros on the flip-flops. Since naturally reset, when you reset flip-flops, the Q outputs all go low. So I always make my idle state zero. Okay, because that's the natural way that the FPGA is going to power up is with those flip-flops cleared typically. So my idle state is a value of zero. But I don't like using numbers for my states, so I like to use names. So this is why I use this local parameter. OK, so if we're in reset, the, the output of the five flip-flops is going to be this value, which is zero. Zero, 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 zero on all the bits. Otherwise, if we're not in reset, I've said, that the next value I want for the state, or in other words, the next value I want on the Q output of the D flip-flops, is this variable. So this is the key to the whole state machine, is, is how this one wire state next gets calculated. And the way that gets calculated is in this next always block. This is where the guts of the state machine is. So let's look at this always block. This is just a big always block. It goes all the way down to here. And you'll notice one of the key things about it is there are no, now these were non-blocking assignments. Okay, these will get turned into flip-flops. Okay, using non-blocking assignments. You notice in the state machine itself, they're all blocking, but there are absolutely no delays in here whatsoever. And so this whole state machine gets turned into pure combinatorial logic. Okay, and how does it do that? Well, notice that we have a case statement at the beginning. The case statement is going to be used based on our current state, the output of those flip-flops, OW state. So here I said case OW state. So when we start off, we're in idle. Okay. So during idle, that D out pin, we're just starting up from reset. So we're right here. We want this D out to stay low. And we're going to want it to stay low for this amount of delay time. So let's go back down here to our state machine. 
So the first thing I do is it's going to stay here as long as we're in reset, remember? Okay, if we're in reset, it's going to stay in idle no matter what. But as soon as we're out of reset, then this thing starts to, starts to move to the next state. So I said that the next state is going to be OW delay, this one. Okay. So now, when the flip-flops clock on the next rising edge of clock, it'll clock into the cues, it'll clock in that next state, which will be OW delay, which, remember, I have values for, which is 1 up here. Okay. Then, what's going to happen, okay, so on the next positive edge of clock, the state will actually go to o OW delay. So now when we're in that state, it's going to calculate an, an OW state next based on the current state. So now we're in OW delay. So if we're in that state, the only time that we're going to go to the, the next state here, OW frame, is when we've, when our delay counter has, has counted all the way up to that certain amount of time. And that's what this num delay clocks is. Now num delay clocks is just a simple calculation. It's the, I said, this delay time is in milliseconds. So if we take the clock frequency and we divide by a thousand and multiply it by the delay time, that'll give us the number of clocks based on this frequency that we need in order to get this number of milliseconds of delay. So it's a fairly, in this case, it's a fairly large count. So we go back down here. So this delay count, if it's not equal to num delay clocks, it stays in this state. Because I've said OW state next is equal to OW delay, the same one we're in. So let's take a look. Let me give you an up oh, sorry. Let me give you an idea of how that I'll just kind of draw this. Let's say we have one, two, three, four, five. There's our five flip flops. Okay, I didn't draw very good. Get the idea. Okay, these flip flops, they all have Q outputs. Okay, and they all have a D input, and they all have a clock, that's our clock, okay? So each of these have a D input. Okay, and then I'm going to just call this our logic, our combinational logic, and that's from that always block that has the case statement and everything in it. So basically, these feed into that that logic, which is all just AND and OR type gates, it reduces down to. And then, this comes back out, just a sec, let me draw this. This connects in. Okay, and the direction here is this direction for all of these. The direction here is this direction for all of these. And then we have other inputs, okay? And they may be one or more bits. They could be multiple bits, like the data count or any other signal coming in. Okay, so this is this is the. Uh, let's see if I can do this. I'm not very good at this. This is our st state machine logic. Oh. Okay. So that's our state machine logic. So this is what it's actually turning into. So. This this set of lines right here, this five, uh, I can't draw, but anyway, that's a five. <laughs> this is the OW state. Next. Let's go back to our, uh, this OW state next. That's what we're calculating to feed back into those flip-flops. So anyway, when we're in this state, we have to wait for the delay count to count up. Well, we somewhere we need to initialize that delay count, so I actually do that up here. Let's see where that is. Here's the logic for it. I said if I'm not in state O delay, then I'm going to clear the delay count just to make sure it gets set back to zero. So if we're not in OW delay, it gets set to zero. If we are in that state, then this counter keeps counting up until I get um, 
up to num delay clocks. So if delay count is not equal to num delay clocks, I just keep incrementing the counter. Okay. So this counter, that's the logic for this counter, and you see that it's based on my state machine as to when it clears and as to how it counts and when it counts. And so this this too is flip flops and it's however many flip flops delay count uh, right there. That many bits, DS bits total. And DS of course was made from this num delay clocks. So I have to count from zero to num delay clocks minus one. So that's where that comes in. And there's similar variables in here for doing all of this logic. B count, XD, data count, these are other variables I use. And they're all based upon that state, OW state, and any other inputs or conditions. So once the uh, delay time is over, the next thing it'll do is it'll just go to this frame state. And in this state, I basically don't do anything, but I do use it in some of my um, logic up here to determine certain things like when to clear certain counters. So basically it's in this state for just one clock and then it goes on. Okay, so it goes to this OW sync high. And so basically this state, it's going to stay in this state for uh, the first quarter of a cycle and it's going to put out a high on the D out put. So let's go back up here. See during, for this first sync bit, I want to put out a high for the first quarter of the cycle and then for the next three quarters I'll put out a low and then I'll re want to repeat this four more times. So let's go back down to the state machine. And here, the way I know when the uh, time is up is I have another counter, I call it B count. And if it's not equal to Q1, if you remember that was calculation of the first, the number of clocks I need to count to get through the first quarter of the bit time. So once it counts up, then it can go to the uh, next state, which is the sync low. Otherwise, it just stays in this state and puts out a high. And then this state is similar. As soon as B count gets up to the full length of a bit, that says Q1234, then it can, it can go on and can do other things. I think we're getting close to our uh, time. We can come back to this and finish uh, after the lecture. And then we can also talk about the one wire receiver and how it functions. So basically, this, uh, this is how the state machine works. Any questions? Do I still have everybody? Yeah, it looks good. Yep, no, very good. Okay, is that starting to make a little more sense now? Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah, um, I don't think our lecture will take a f real long time today. And we can come back and maybe talk a little bit more about the rest of this state machine. But I think if you follow it through, well, if, it, if anybody wants a copy of this uh, one wire transmit.v and one wire receive.v, um, I could just post it on our site. If, uh, please I'd do. I'd like to see that. Okay. I'll post them on with the um, rest of the labs and stuff. One quick question, Kirk. Okay. Um, on your transmit, you're the Aussie board is just transmitting this sort of in the blind. It, I mean, there's no handshaking going on here whatsoever, right? Right. Okay. Yeah. And the whole key for somebody else to be able to receive it is, is that we always have this rising edge every time period. Now, the way that the receiver is going to know that, that's, that's where the sync bits come in. Um, basically, this delay time is to allow for any other boards out there to get reset, do whatever they need to, to initialize themselves, so that um, when these sync bits come along, they can start the, the, the receiver can actually calculate the time between this rising edge and this rising edge and to this rising edge and this one and this one. So it'll, it can go one, two, three, four, and say, okay, I have four values, 
four counts for each of these and I'll just take an average of them and that'll be my TB. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the receiver may have a totally different uh, clock frequency and, and, and in this case they, they do because Ozzy is using a 48 megahertz clock to generate all this stuff. Okay. And Mercury and Penelope have the 122 megahertz clock that they're using. But it doesn't matter because they all they have to do is just calculate the, the number of clocks from here to here to know the time period. They don't need to know anything about the frequency that this was generated at at the other end. Yep. Okay. So the, the sync bits are for the receiver's benefit just to get ready to know when, okay, so let's say the receiver counts 300 clocks. It takes it 300 clocks from this edge to this edge. Then the receiver knows that after this low time, when the data starts coming, right after the next uh, low to high transition, whether it be a logic 0 or a logic 1, it knows it's going to take 300 clocks for that data. And so it can go out there halfway and sample in the middle. That was the whole idea behind it. Yep. So there's a lot of other ways this could have been implemented. This is just something I picked and chose to do. Okay. So now we're going to look at the bus functional model some more. Okay, here we have a some sort of CPU interface. And in fact, I think it's sort of similar to the old uh, Motorola 68000. Anyway, in this particular CPU, uh, we're going to look at a read cycle and a write cycle. In this one, the read cycle consists of the address changing. And uh, for a read cycle, the read would be high. And then after some amount of time, the address strobe goes low, specifying that we've got an address ready. And then after address strobe goes low, then there's some specified amount of time where the data actually gets put onto the bus from a high impedance to whatever value we need. And also at that time the data strobe goes low. Another one of our timings is there's a time from the data strobe going low to when address strobe gets removed again and and the address changes. Also at the time address strobe goes high then data strobe sometime after that whatever this amount of time is will actually go high too. Similar for the write cycle we have timings in a very similar manner and as you can see here, once the address strobe goes low, this is an asynchronous protocol. That causes a DTAC here. I called it data strobe, I think, in the last one. I'll call it DTAC now, I guess. Um, and then that, of course, going low causes this to go high, and that going high causes this to go high. Similar for the right cycle. When this goes low, sometime later this will go low. And then because of this going low, sometime later this will go high. And then because of this going high, Sometime later, this will go high. So let's look at how we might make a uh, read task. Basically, we're going to need, for inputs, we're going to need an address to read. And for output, we're going to need data. And this will be an asynchronous implementation. And we want to make some sort of timing checks in this. So let's look at a little snippet of code and how we might start off doing this. So here we have a task called CPU read. And I've defined the address as being 8 bits wide. That's an input. And the output is 8 bits wide. That'll be our data that we get from doing the read. And I've declared a register called time that will um, be used for some timing checks that we want to do. And then we'll have our code in here. So let's look at what we might put in our code now. Okay. If we're starting off for a read, 
first of all our address is going to be be set we want to set our address to whatever we're given ADDR so let's go back and look see our ADDR we want to set it to that we want to set the read write line to a value of 1 right here then we want to delay some amount of time before we assert the address strobe okay so this is our delay and here we set address strobe to 0 okay so this is just a little snippet of just this portion of it okay now let's look at another snippet of where we've said that we want the uh, after address strobe goes low that's this statement here let's record the time okay and then wait for the negative edge of this DTAC and then let's take a look at the difference between the time that this goes low and the time that we saved back here stamp okay so if it's less than some certain amount of time that we want to tell it then we might print out that hey you know something is wrong here you know it didn't meet our qualifications for the design let's also we might also want to do a similar thing based on the DTAC okay once it goes low that's this negative edge of DTAC we may, may want to delay a certain amount of time and then set the address strobe high and at that point we may also want to grab the data so this is another little snippet of something we may want to do when we create this model okay so we set our data and if you remember our data was our output for the task. And then another thing we may want to check is after after we've set address strobe high, does DTAC go back high within a certain amount of time? So when we set address strobe high, let's record our uh, time by setting stamp equal to dollar sign time, and then we'll wait for the positive edge of DTAC, and then we'll check the difference in time to see if it's less than a certain amount of time that uh, we've uh, spe that you know is spec for this particular design, and if it's not, we may do some error, print some error, do something that specifies, hey, you know, the DTAC didn't go high like it was supposed to. So now let's kind of look at some of the things that we would need to do in a write task. Okay, for inputs, we're going to need an address to write, and we're going to need the data to write. And again, this is an asynchronous implementation with timing checks that we want to have. So here's kind of the guts of our CPU write. We would have two inputs, 8 bits wide for address and data in this case. And then again a uh, time variable so that we can record some time for some timing checks. So here when we start off on a write cycle now, you would set the address right here we get set to whatever you're being given. Okay, address and the data too it also gets set to whatever we're being given in the task right here that's what we're being given okay and we would set the read write line to a, a zero and then we would delay a certain amount of time right here and then we'd set the address strobe low okay now we're going to want to do a, a timing check so at the time address strobe goes low we're going to re want to record the time then wait for the negative edge of DTAC and then do our checking to see you know did it go low within a certain amount of time or not so this is just another little snippet of something we would need to do and here's another little uh, snippet of something we need to do in the task and also at the time of the negative edge of DTAC we want to uh, delay a certain amount of time and then we want to set the data to high impedance right here and we want to set the address strobe back to high after a certain that certain amount of time has occurred then another thing that we need to do is when the address strobe does go high then we need to record that time and do another timing check to make sure the DTAC goes back high within a certain amount of time so just like we did on the read so those are the types of things that we need to do for this. And let's assume that that's implemented. And then how can we use it? We can now perform software-like tests, sort of like read, modify, write. So here we go. 
So here I've created an initial statement and a block, begin in block called test. And I've uh, created an 8 bit data register. And here now I can call those tasks CPU read, I can feed it the 8 bit address and the 8 bit data. Yeah, there may be other things you do before this, but. Um, and then we can actually look at the data once that task is finished and see, oh, let's say we wanted to know whether or not it was zero, and then we might print out something based on what data got returned. Or maybe we want to modify the data slightly. In this case, we're going to modify data bit zero, and then we're going to write it back out to this, this address. So here you have a, a more software-like test that you can write by using tasks. So this is tasks are really good for doing uh, simulation test benches. They're not synthesizable. This is just for test using tests and simulation. Now let's go back and let's assume that anything in this design could be broken. Maybe the DTAC doesn't, uh, you know, go. Not only does it not go uh, change to go back high in a certain amount of time, but maybe it just plain old doesn't occur. It never goes low. So how do we check for that? Anybody have an idea? What kind of what kind of Verilog statements did we look at in the past where we're checking for things? Well, that's where the fork and join come in real handy. Okay, remember, for a fork join statement block, here we have one called DTAC or, this block, this begin in block, and this begin in block execute in parallel, right? So, in order to get out of the fork join, what has to happen? Both blocks have to end, or the block has to get disabled. So we're going to use the disables here. And what we've done is we've said, for this block, it waits for the negative edge of DTAC. And if that happens, then it does a disable of this block, and so it would get out of it. Well, if DTAC comes along, then that's great. We would get out of this block. If DTAC doesn't come along, then this block here will, is executing too in parallel. And after this certain amount of time, then it kicks it out. Okay. So then we can check to see if the DTAC is low or not and determine what happened. Okay, we can check to see if the timeout has expired. So the fork join is useful in doing these timing type checks. So if the neg edge comes along, DTAC's going low, then it'll knock us out. If it doesn't come along, then this timeout will kick us out. So we're kicked out of this block one way or the other, either after the neg edge or after a time, a certain amount of time. And we can use that to determine what kind of errors we might want to report. Uh, another thing is before you even go into the fork join, you might want to check and see, well, if DTAC's already low, there's no need to wait for the uh, neg edge. It may already be low. And you may want to do something based on that. So you need to test for all kinds of conditions to, in order to simulate uh, functional and actually to test the functionality of the device. So in Lab 8.1, 8 .1, I want you to learn how to write CPU bus functional models and learn how to perform read and write cycles using CPU bus functional models. So I think, it, yeah, in your lab, you're going to have something like this. So let's kind of go through it real quick. Okay, here's a uh, CPU interface that uses a 16 megahertz i386XX bus. And as you can see here, the clock consists of a phase one and phase two type setup. <coughs> Excuse me. And from phase two going high, you can see that the address will change uh, Typic, this could be either a min, typical, or max. Anyway, there's a delay, and in this case it would be like 4 nanoseconds, and the address changes. Here we have the 
address strobe changing from that rising edge, 4 nanoseconds, read write changing 4 nanoseconds, and then here this time is 4 nanoseconds. There may be a certain number of wait states depending on how long ready is before it's asserted low. And notice that the rising edge on phase 2, not phase 1, checks um, the ready. It's going to sample the ready. But in order for ready to be valid, it needs to be there 19 nanoseconds before this rising edge. Okay, That's called a setup. And then it also needs to be there for 4 nanoseconds after the rising edge. That's called a hold time. Similar for data. You've got 9 nanoseconds of setup and 6 nanoseconds of hold. Okay, So that's a read cycle. Then you have similar type things for the write cycle. Similar timing. Setup holds, different delays. So if you're making, you're going to be making a block, uh, a functional model here, and a bus functional model, sorry. And these are the type of signals that you're going to have. You're going to have a clock, and that'll be an input, and it'll be one bit wide. Okay. You're going to have an address. It's going to be eight bits wide. You're going to have the address strobe and the read write and the ready. Those will all be one bit wide. And the data ready or data accepted, that's the one that introduces the, the wait cycles, Okay, depending on when it gets asserted. And then you're going to have a bidirectional data bus of 8 bits. And this will be your register map that you'll have in your lab. It's um, basically just two addresses. Address 0 will be what we call a status register. You're going to make a status register. And address 1, you're going to make a mask register. Okay, so it's going to be sort of an interesting lab for you, hopefully. Let's talk about observability now. Sometimes it's necessary to look at internal signals in your design, not just the very top level signals. And currently we've, well, we've observed signals through the pins of the top level module, but we need a mechanism for improved observability so that we can actually maybe look at signals down in the design. Okay, so let's say we have a test bench, and in that test bench we've instantiated a module, but that module is a hierarchical type module. And in our test bench at the top, we want to be able to access something way down the hierarchy down here. We want to look at it. So we want to observe, a, say, a particular signal or test a certain signal. So how do we get to it? Well, one way is through the uh, module pins, you could put that signal in the module pin list and bring it back up through each module. Okay, But that's going to be a high maintenance thing because you're going to have to insert them in, physically edit your files, put them in, and then when you're done, since it's not something you need, it's just something you're testing, you're going to have to rip it back out. And so it's a lot of high maintenance. So the language actually provides a, a hierarchical type access, and that's what we're going to look at. One thing to remember is that it can't check the correct correctness of the hierarchical name at compile time. So you may compile just fine, but then when you go to simulate, say like you're using model sim, you'll actually get an error at that time because they'll say, hey, I, you know, I can't find this. What are you talking about? Okay, So don't expect the compiler to actually be able to, to check it. So a hierarchical name is similar to full path name in a computer file system. Hierarchies are separated with a period. Things such as instances, blocks, and task names are like directories. Registers and wires are like files. And the name of the top level modules are like roots. And names can be relative to current module instance. OK, and there's no equivalent to a dot dot like you have in Unix or something. So let's look at how this works. Here I have a top level module. It's called top. And you see that I've instantiated two instances of the same FIFO, but I've given them different instance names, one called in, one called out. And then here's the module FIFO, you know, and in it, it has a wire we'll call W, and then it has another instantiation of a module called RAM with an instance name of buff. 
and here's the module RAM and in, in it it's got an initial block let's say there's gonna be a lot of other stuff but these are just some of the things in it it's gonna have a begin to end block that we've named B and then a register inside of that called R so here's our structure we have top and then we have our in and out FIFOs right here and then within each of those we have a, a wire W and then a uh, we've instantiated the module called RAM which we've called buff and then inside of it the begin in block B and register R so that's our structure so how do we access something like the wire called W within the in FIFO well here's here's an instance of another module we've thrown in called we'll call it side if I wanted to access that I could say top dot in dot w okay and in the module top let's say that I wanted to access this register down here in the out FIFO so I could say out dot buff dot b dot r that's how you would get down to it and that way there's no need to bring that particular signal up through the pin list of each of the modules so that would access it directly so you might you might have some other register that you assign equal to this or you might do some test of this to see if it's some value anyway but this is what you would use for the name okay and here's another example here we're in the module FIFO and I said buff.b.r well that could be either this R or this R depending on which FIFO it was that we instantiated up here okay so in lab 8.2 I want you to learn how to use hierarchical names and learn how to bypass interfaces for additional visibility going to talk more about full timing simulation now. So let's say we're wanting hey, to... Um, one second. Okay. Um, um, uh, back like about three slides or so, um, I lost the connection for just a brief period of time, so the recording won't have it either, from what I can tell. But um, did it was only it was the slide about... Um, is this synthesizable, the way that you can access um, nodes? All the way down. I mean, it's probably not. It's you know, not visible, it, but can yeah. you? Can you? It's not. Can you this is not down? something you synthesize. This is something um, you're going to use for for observability for testing for your test benches. Um, there's been cases, you know, that in some of the FPGA stuff that I've done, that there might be a timing issue inside the FPGA, and it would be useful to you know, bring out a signal internally, you know, on a live FPGA. Would you be able to do it this way? No, this is not, well, what you typically do in the live FPGA is, there, there's a couple different ways that you can actually do this. Um, for Altera, they have a thing called signal tap. And signal tap actually inserts some extra logic in with your logic so that you can observe certain signals and you can actually capture them. And then through the JTAG port, it'll you can read them out and you can see what it captured. Basically, it uses like an internal FIFO, and it just captures a FIFO's worth of data with the clock, and you um, then you read that back out onto your screen, and you can look at timing waveforms. I'll show you that sometime. That would be good for a demonstration. So that's that's one method. The other method, okay, if you actually bring a signal all the way. Yeah, the way you bring it, um, I don't think you can, I don't think you can, I'm not sure that you can use this, I don't think it'll synthesize, I'd have to check. Um, you can either bring it up through the pins if you needed to, um, or typically you'd use like signal tap for the uh, Altera parts, or for Xilinx they have one that's called chip scope that does a similar thing. Or you would just take that pin and, and bring it out to another pin on the FPGA. I mean, you take that signal and bring it out to a pin. Yeah, if, if you do that, then it looks like you got to like go through, you know, pull it all the way up through the modules. Yeah, that's why. 
know, if you could access it directly, then you can put it right to the pin. Yeah, it, the preferable way to do it, like with most of these things now on the FPGA, is either use like the signal tap functionality or the chip scope for Xilinx. Um, that allows you to look at what are a bunch of signals actually, not just one. You can you can pick a whole bunch of signals and look at them that way, and you get like a it looks like a logic analyzer because it'll print out on your screen you know waveforms. So typically, you're not going to want to just have one signal when you're when you're debugging something like that. You're going to want a bunch of signals. So it's, um. Yeah, I've never tried to. I, I've never tried to use this for um, bringing a particular signal out. I don't think it'll do that. But this is very good for simulation. Um, you know, you want your simulation to first be able to functionally check that your design is working, and then we're going to talk about um, timings. That's what we're fixing to talk about next. Um, but there are cases where you actually want to see, you know, you've gone through all your timing analysis, the tool has that you're using. You've gone through all your timing analysis. Um, everything appears to functionally be working in your simulation, but yet the design doesn't work. And um, that's what you're talking about. And that's where the chip scope and uh, signal tap comes in really handy. I need to show that sometime so you can see how that works. So let's talk a little bit more about timing and mod timing models. So you could uh, model your logic gates using some standard delays, and that might be good enough for a rough timing simulation. So let's say you have a an AND gate, with an A and a B input, and it has some type of load, capacitive or some wire load out there. And in this case, we've modeled it with a rise and a fall delay. And here's our AND statement. So this is a, just sort of a rough timing simulation. But we may want to get more accurate. So in order to get more accurate, we need to know things such as the load on the output and um, maybe the uh, length of the wire in the device, like if you have an FPGA or an ASIC and uh, what they call the wire loading. And different instances of the same module can drive different loads. Okay. So in the case of this, okay, here we've just said that in general, all of these AND gates are, have the same load. They have the same rise and fall. Well, that may not be true. For a rough timing thing, that, that may be all right. But in real life, it's not going to be because in an ASIC, things are used with different loads and different wire links and everything. Okay, so delays are instance specific. And so you can't really hard code them if you want an accurate timing model. So the solution is what's called special parameters. And special parameters are overwritten by an external delay file. So I'm going to briefly touch on these special parameters. I'm not going to go into any real detail on these. This is something that you can look at and cover on your own if you're really interested in knowing how to create these accurate timing models. Okay, there's what's called the specify block. And in that specify block, there are things called spec params. And so it could define a, uh, a delay from the A pin to the C pin of being 2.2 for rise and 3.4 for the fall. And for the B pin, maybe it defines them a little differently. Okay, and for pin to pin delays, it might have, it may use those spec params that, you ju that were defined here. These, however, can be overwritten, and I'm going to show you that in a little while. But if you want to go into how the specify block and all of these spec param stuff work, um, that's you're going to get to do that on your own. <laughs> okay, we're going to rely. Um, you're going to rely mostly upon the vendor's tool, such as in this case Quartus, the Altera tool, to actually create all these timings and stuff for you, and to actually check them. And I'll show you more about that later. So in order to get accurate delays, you need some sort of an external delay calculator, we'll call it. 
Okay, that external delay calculator is something that the Altera tools can actually do, or the Xilinx tools. They can do that type of thing because they know about their parts. And they can calculate those delays based upon the, the loading of the gate. Say, like in this case, this gate, you can see it has uh, a wider fan out than this gate over here. You know, and the loadings can be different. Um, Also, the, what we call the wire loads, they can become a dominant load factor. You know, like you're going on the FPGA, this may be a short path with a certain load. This may be a longer path to another gate with a certain load. So the delays here uh, can be very different. Okay, this is just a, uh, I'm just showing you kind of a simple RC wire load delay model. The ASIC or your FPGA tools can produce what's called an SDF file. And it can do that at various steps in the implementation process. And the degree of accuracy... I'm sorry, I can't do it. Hello? i got to do this and do it. Okay. The degree of accuracy increases with the level of details. So if you don't run it through the tools, other than you're just running simulation tests, the default is there's no SDF created. And so let's say in your... Um, module you had something where you said R equals R1. Well, there wouldn't be any physical delay to that. I mean, this all happens at the same time. So you would just see R become the same value as R1 all the time with no delay between them. However, after floor planning, you know, this R, this R might be physically, you know, you know, one side of the chip than R1. So you, in real life, there's actually going to be some delay that time difference there. You know, if it's got to travel across the chip, even though those chips are really small, there's still some time associated with that. So you'll get increasing uh, accuracy as you go through each of these steps, like floor planning, after post synthesis, after you do a placement, and then after you do a route. Okay, it'll increase as we go down the steps. So these accurate delay values are stored in this SDF file, which is a standard delay file. Instance specific delay values are back annotated in the simulator. So after you've compiled um, and you've done all your place and route and those type of things, the delay calculator can create this SDF file, which you can use in your Verilog simulation to get a much more accurate timing model of how the signals are going to look. Okay. Typically, well, no, I'll talk about that later. Here's, here's sort of the process that you may go through for creating an ASIC, let's say. So for Verilog, I mean, you're, we're going to create a real part now. You're going to use RTL code. So you create an RTL model. You may start off with a behavioral model just to get yourself up and going in simulation to see that yeah, this does what I want it to do. And then you may turn around and replace that behavioral model with a real RTL model that's going to synthesize real real logic. So anyway, we'll, we'll say we start off with an RTL model. You can do a functional simulation. That, and the functional simulation is we don't worry so much about uh, the timing and the del delays as we do that the thing is just functioning properly. It looks like everything is working correctly. And when that's happening, then you're at a point where you could actually synthesize it and you could get a, a gate level mod model. It'll turn it into real, you know, flip-flops and 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 OR gates and all that kind of stuff. And at that point, you could, you could then take that model and you could do another functional simulation, make sure things are okay. You could run it on down through the um, uh, place and route and layout and get a standard delay file and then use that in conjunction with your model to actually do fu both functional and timing simulation to make sure thing it's still working even after you know all the even after it's calculated all the delays we want to make sure that it's still functioning and the FPGA may be the same process or it could be a little different some some of them may actually create from the RTL model they may create what they call a primitive net list such as Xilinx and it saves it in this uh, .xnf format file and then you could create a gate level model and do the same type of things. So this is basically the same as the last one. So the SDF file actually annotates pin-to-pin -pin delays, interconnect delays, and 
timing constraints such as setup and hold and pulse width it'll check it can check all of that kind of stuff for you so that's where you have to rely on the vendor tools to do a lot of this for you you're not going to be making if you're designing an FPGA you're not going to be de designing the all the timing models because they're going to do that for you okay but if you are a Xilinx vendor and you're uh, needing to create models for the delays then you might have to be writing Verilog if you're working for Xilinx or somebody where you're creating models for this kind of stuff that's where this would come in you can use the dollar sign SDF underscore annotate system task to back annotate simulation and it's normally done at time zero and it can be done at any time if you use this particular option so here's the syntax and then here's a an example of how it's used okay so this is our device under test so to speak and there we can create that so in 8.3 you're going to and you can do this optionally uh, you can learn how to back annotate a gate level simulation using an SDF file and you can learn how to interface to a third-party FPGA model and you can learn how to program a LMG smart circuit FPGA model and learn how to alternate between simulation configurations so this is sort of an optional exercise I'll call it okay so that's it for today's lecture it looks like we have two more lectures left before the end of the series we're gonna start talking a little bit more about RTL coding and so that's why I'm going to start talking to you more about the actual code here now is because um, you're kind of getting to that point so before I go back to our uh, example code here do I have any other questions if not I'm gonna get a drink of water Okay, would everybody like to um, <clears throat> go back to looking at our uh, one wire transmit and receive stuff? Sure. Okay. Yes, uh, are we gonna maybe move on to the receiver. Yes, okay. Let's go ahead and do that. Let's go ahead and move on to the receiver now. Okay, for the receiver, basically we have the same um, information here. But for the receiver, I have a, uh, a reset signal coming in, a clock signal, the receive data, which is an output, okay, and it's data bits wide, and a receive ready that says, okay, we've got new data, and the one bit signal, which we're bringing in from the uh, transmitter called DN. I should have changed that here. Yeah, this is code in progress. <laughs> Safe. Okay, so here I have some parameters, sync bits. My default is five, and that's like in the transmitter. Okay, and I'm just going to leave it at that for the default. Could reduce it or increase it if we wanted to for some reason. There we go, five. And I said my default for the number of data bits is 64. Okay, and this other parameter, I'll talk about that later. Um, so, based on data bits again, so let's assume we had 64. So if I wanted to make a counter that counted from 0 to 64 minus 1, I would need a register that was this size. And that's what that function again calculates. So I put it down here at the bottom of this module. So it can determine how many data bits. and then I have some local registers that I'm going to use in the code here I've just created some various ones and then my state machine <clears throat> for this particular module I need uh, two bits okay so this is my state and this is my next state and then I've created a register that's 16 bits wide and four deep so I've created four of these 16-bit wide 
Okay, so what am I going to use that for? I'm going to use that to record my sync bit timings. Okay, so I'm going to record. I want to know. Oh, excuse me here. There. Save. I want to record the time from here to here. That'll go in that in the first register, then the time from here to here going the next one and so on. So I'm going to record those four times, see how many clocks it takes. Okay. Now, in general, here I have an always block that's clocking on the positive edge of the clock. Now, there are some flip-flops that'll clock on the negative edge. So you could you can do that if you wanted to, but it's typical to use the positive edge of the clock because what's inside of this always block. This is this module is written in RTL code, which is a subset of Verilog. So everything in here gets turned into real physical hardware. So everything in this always block is written in such a manner that these signals, all these different ones, are flip flops. They become flip flops, D flip flops. Okay, so you can see there's several. Question. Okay. Just looking at that code, can can you make that statement? I mean, I, the, I mean, how, how when I see that, I, I wouldn't know whether that could be turned into flip flops or or uh, or anything else. Okay, we're we are gonna we're gonna talk more about it. But the way that I've structured and written the code is what determines that it gets turned into D flip flops or flip flops. Okay. And, okay. and principally, it's because you're using non-blocking assignments here. Is that, is that yeah. the idea? Yes, no? they're non-blocking. You use okay. non-blocking assignments. So okay. you you gotcha. use always at some clock edge. That's the first thing. And then I use non-blocking assignments. Okay. Gotcha. Now there is one thing you'll notice in here, and I want to point this out. You'll see that I have this delay thing here. This doesn't get synthesized. I use this merely for simulation purposes, okay, to give me some rough timing model, okay? That's the only purpose that this value is here. And I've, I've defined this TPD up here at the beginning to be 1.3 nanoseconds, okay? So it's just a rough timing model. And the reason I do that for my simulation purposes is so that I can see that, okay, there's a real physical delay from D to out, I mean from D to Q. And so when I see a clock edge and I see D to Q change, um, if I didn't have any delay and it were exactly on top of the clock edge, I might be curious, well, well did this really happen just before or just after or, you know, what actually happened there. It's a lot easier to see if I have a slight delay after the clock edge that okay yeah it's because it's a clock to I mean it's a clock to Q output delay. So that's for s this TPD I'm only using I just call that my typical prop delay. I just stick that in there merely for uh, simulation purposes. The uh, for RTL code it ignores this completely. Okay, so anyway, all of this stuff in this particular always block, because I have the at pause edge clock and I'm using non blocking, these are flip flops. These become flip flops. And then again, this always block, now this is a notation you can use. You could say at and then parentheses and list all the different inputs and things that might change, such as the uh, db rise, the tb state, the resync, whatever variables I'm using in here, but I, you can use this shorthand notation and then you don't have to list them all because when you're changing your code you might change, you know, for a while maybe I got resync in here, but maybe I take it out and put something in, that way you don't forget. You don't have to worry about changing the list all the time. So this is, this is a much nicer notation now that they have that you can use. So any change in any of the any of the variables coming in here, anytime they change, then this recalculates. So here we have a simple state machine, and you'll notice in this one they're blocking. Question: uh, How do you know what's what's included in the any? Uh, say that again. So in other words, uh, the, 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 uh, how do you know what the asterisk refers to? The asterisk refers to any 
of the signals being used in this in this uh, block. Anytime any of them change, it'll actually come. It'll actually go back through here again. So remember that we're using an at. So anytime any of this input signal, any of the signals in here that you're using, anytime they change, then it comes back through the block again for simulation purposes. Maybe another way to ask a question about that would be uh, once once you finally get your uh, your model finalized in your own mind, would you go back and change that asterisk to be a, a finite list of variables? No, this is you could do it this way. You know, where you're doing you list all your signals in here, you know, and then you mm -hmm. close it with a parenthesis. But, you know, these might constantly change while you're changing the design, and it's sort of a pain in the butt to have to, you know, go and constantly change this list all the time. So instead, you just get rid of the list, and you do the star, and that's the equivalent. Much nicer. But in your final design, in your final design, you would have a list, or you would not? No, this is the final design. Oh, that Okay, okay. Yeah. You, if you want to put the list in and do it that way, that's fine. But you have to make sure you've got all the signals in there. Okay. But yeah, I, it, I, I like this notation. In <laughs> practice, this would be the easiest, easiest way all the time. Yeah. This is the way I always do it because it's much easier to do this now, now that they've allowed this in the language. Gotcha. So I like this. So then I just say always at and then star. And um, so basically, this whole block—it's not—it's not running on a clock or anything. This just gets this whole block right here just gets turned into AND and OR gates. And that would be—oops, sorry. Let me bring up. You know, that would be this block here, and this is all like I say, just you know, AND 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 OR gate type things. You know, you know, gets turned into just pure combinatorial logic. Okay, so in the state machine, you're feeding it basically the output of the flip-flops. Okay, that's the current state. The current state is the value that's on these flip -fl output flip-flops, the Q output. Okay, so that feeds into the state machine logic, that combinatorial logic, that always block where we did always at star. And then that gets turned into just pure combinatorial logic which is based upon any of the inputs coming in and then it creates the the next state bits which go to the D inputs. Does that make sense? Hopefully. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. <coughs> so in this state machine you can see I only have three states idle, TB bit, and next. And then I also put in a, a default so that for some reason, if it powers up weird or does something funny and gets off in a wrong state that's not being used, it'll force it back to idle. So this is always a good practice to do, is to put in the default. So here I... So the common thing that you see in each of these is, first of all, each of them are based upon the current state, which is the current, current output, along with different inputs. Okay, such as this signal or this signal or whatever. And then they produce the next state, which is going to be clocked in to the flip flops right here, T B state equals T B state next. So and that's about as simple as it, you can get it. And this method for doing state machines and stuff, um, Works very well. I've never found a kid, you know, I can use it on different vendors and different people. There are, there are, there is another way that you can do some state machine stuff. I'll show that sometime. Uh, but I like this method the best. Question? Okay. Uh, yeah, this is Joe again. If I'm, I'm still trying to understand this, uh, this at star uh, significance because I remember seeing some code earlier that where you had this long list of input outputs and uh, so does the at star only work on a state machine or is and and the other things that I was looking at earlier where you had this very long list of input output signals and pins and stuff uh, you did that and did not use the star on that is, so is there a distinction there or what uh, no mm -mm. I'm just showing you different ways 
So you okay. could have used an at star with those as well? Yeah, probably. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah. All right. I mean, let's take, for example, let's say that I said always at resync. Now, what does that mean, always at resync? How would this always block execute if I did this? Uh, only if uh, resync changed, I guess. Yeah. Any change in it, whether it goes high or low or whatever, just as long as it changes, then it then that allows it to come back through the always again, right? Right. Okay, if I don't list some other signals like DB rise, it's not going to come through when it changes. So you're not going to get right. a true simulation, right? Yes. Of how this block works if you don't list all the signals. Okay. Yeah, I guess my my reiterating my 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 understanding and trying to understand this if okay. if you if you, there are some some instances in your code, and I'm not sure where that where it was, but I, I remember seeing you know, long lists of uh, input output uh, names, where you, if I understand the star stuff, you could have used a star there and not had that long list of names. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. The reason I showed you that is that is the way that you have to do it for the older Ver the Verilog 95 standard. The newer standards, like the Verilog 2001, you don't have to do that anymore. Okay, but okay, I want you, gotcha. I want you to know that that's the way that, you know, some of the older ones. You know, I don't know if you should ever run across the older, you know, versions, but that'll work in all cases. Okay, so I could have written it like this right here, and that would, that would make, you know, make it work the same. Okay, that makes it clear. So, I just. Ever since they said I can replace that with the star, I've done this. <laughs> okay, so now I'm telling you about the new method. Okay, but you have examples of the old method in various files. Oh that yeah, you showed us. Yeah, yeah, and I want you to do it that way for now. Okay. Okay, but you, you once you're done with yep. the lab, once you're done with the labs and everything, then, and you go ahead with the lab, go ahead and try the star, if you want. I just want you to know the the basic Verilog syntax, and um, you know there still may be some of the compilers out there that may not like the star. I think most of them by now, you know, will take it. They're they're up to the 2001 standard. For a while, you know, within the last few years, not everybody was up to the 2001 standard. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, so that's my preference now. I really like it. <laughs> So yeah, I may make you do some things that are old school for a little while, just so that you, you know, appreciate the new stuff. <laughs> well, it's all new stuff. <laughs> okay, yeah, it's all new stuff. Anyway, you st I think you still need to know about the other, just so that you understand what this star is really doing. Yeah, well, that helps. Thanks. Okay, so this particular state machine, there's only uh, three bits, and um, so the first thing I do in idle, well, of course, we go back to our um, flip-flop here. Let's see, there, TB state. And I've said that any time we're in reset, I'm gonna, it's always going to stay in idle. I don't care what's going on with the rest of this logic down here. I'm forcing it to stay you know, in idle state. So now once the reset's gone, the TB state will be whatever the TB state next is. And this is just the way I kind of do it. You can put whatever you like here. You can put some other name or whatever. I just like to put the next because that's the next state. Um, so here, once reset's gone away, then what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking for the signal called DB rise. And if it's true, then I'm going to go to the next state. Okay, so what is this DB rise? Well, this is the beginning of a data bit or a sync bit. So how do I determine this? Let's go look for DB rise. I'm going to show you a cute little trick. Okay, so let's look at our signals again. So what I'm wanting to do is I'm wanting to determine, how do you determine when you have the rising edge of a signal? Do you know how to do that? I'm going to show you how to do that. Okay. Let's... At pause edge. Well, 
this is a, this is not a clock. This is actually a signal. Okay, you, you're running on a clock. The state machine is running on, and in this case for the receiver, let's say that the receiver is over in uh, Mercury. Okay, it's got a 122 megahertz clock, and you've so your state machine, your flip-flops, the clock to the flip-flops is running on that 122 megahertz, and this is a signal coming in a pin, and you're going to sample this signal. So. Let's assume that the, the clock speed is much greater than this pulse width here, okay? Which it is. So here's how you can do that. Let me see if I can draw this. A file. No. No. Okay. So let's say that I have, let's just say that I have a signal that changes, okay? There's a signal coming in a pin. Okay, maybe it's that pulse we're going to look at. Now, I also have a, um, a clock. Okay, that's pretty, isn't it? I can draw. <laughs> okay. Like a five-year-old. Yeah, okay. As my wife calls them, I draw wiggly lines. That's what I do for work. <laughs> so, now, let's say that I had a D flip-flop. Okay, now here's the clock. That's that. We'll call that right here. C. This is C. Okay, and this is my signal. Okay, and this is the the D input, and this is the Q. Okay, so now let's and we'll call this Q1. Okay, so Q1 in real life here would look like this. And then this this edge where this you know there might be some delay here. It's going to come up. It's going to do like this, and basically, it's going to go like that, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So now, what happens if I do this? Okay. Same clock. I feed it through this. Well. This is Q1. Now let's draw Q2. Q2 comes along. Oh, that was bad. <laughs> and then it'll go down over here. Oh, you know, I should have should have done this a little differently. Anyway, it'll go down on the next clock, okay, because this clock edge determines that. Right? So this is Q2. Now, here's what's interesting. Assuming this is a high-speed clock, okay. I mean, it, the the clock with the, I mean, this clock is faster than this this pulse here. Notice that if I take uh, Q1, and I uh, or I could take Q bar, but anyway, let's say I and this with a knot of Q2. What do I get? I get R right? So it's Q1 anded with the knot of Q2 and I get this pulse. Well, that's nice because now I know where the rising edge occurred, basically. Okay, the what happens out here is still going to be low forever. So anytime this signal comes along, I'll get this one clock-wide pulse, and I'm doing a synchronous design, so everything's based upon the the clock. I get a one-wide pulse, so that basically tells me where the rising edge is. Now I could do a similar thing if I want to do a falling edge. So for the falling edge, you would just have you would have Q1 uh, let's say Q1 naught. I'll put that on the AND gate here. And it with Q2. Okay, now it could be your falling edge pulse. So now let's go back. Okay. So this is this pulse width is much wider than one clock. 
So in reality, you know, like for what I'm doing right now, this the, the width of this whole cycle here may be like 300 clocks. So the width of this is quite a few clocks still, 75 clocks, right? So I get a nice little pulse. If I And here's what I do. I just declared, I said D0, D1, and D2 are registers. And then down here, I... Uh, on reset, I clear those three flip-flops, and then basically I just shift um, dn goes to d0, d0 goes to d1, and d1 goes to d2. So that's just kind of like I was doing here. Uh, go back to here. This would be like d0 and d1. Now I added a d2, and the reason you do that is for something that's called metastability, in case this signal is not synchronous to this clock. If you don't, you'll get what's called metastability issues, and I'll go into that at another time. So basically, I, I put in a third stage, okay? So instead of using, uh, I, I use the last two stages so that I don't have metastability issues. So it just introduces uh, another clock delay, but it saves you some other problems. So anyway, it does the same thing. Let's go back to the code. So there I just shift, I just made those three flip-flops. Okay. Remember, this is the concatenation operator. So what gets assigned to D0 here is the DN. And D1 gets assigned, the, the input for the D1, that's the Q output basically. The D input gets assigned this D0. So the D0 goes to D1, D1 goes to D2. So that's, I could have written this as three separate if statements if I wanted to. So the first one would just say D0 gets assigned a value of one tick B0, and then D0 gets to assign the value of DN. And then for the second statement, I'd have if reset D1 equals zero, else D1 equals D0, and then so on. So I would do the same thing. Does that make sense to everybody? may have to try some of this in simulation to see it. <laughs> uh, comment, Kirk. Okay. Hey, hey Kirk. Um, clearly, uh, I mean, I, since, you, since you went through all this trouble to do this kind of a step, there, that illuminates a, a misunderstanding on my part because I would have thought that you could have done that very simply by using a statement like at pause edge uh, instead of saying clock say Q the, the Q output you know and but that that uh, that doesn't work apparently right well no actually okay no I know what you're talking about let's go back yes so what you would be doing in that case is you would be doing um, you would be taking you're talking about taking this Q right here or this Q1 yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, but what you do in that case is when you do that, then you're tapping that off and you're running that into a clock input. Now you can do that, but when you when you don't use the same clock for all your flip-flops in your FPGA or groups of flip-flops, this the the it, the tools can't calculate the it can't do a timing analysis on it for you. Okay? It can do a timing analysis oh, okay. when you have them like this, where you're using the same clock. But as soon as you do this type of thing, you can do this, okay? It's not recommended, for, and there's a lot of reasons why, but I won't go into them. Um, basically, you should stick to s purely synchronous designs when you can, and only resort to this if you absolutely have to. Okay. Um, we haven't really covered that, but there, there are things known as metastability issues. Um, plus the, the tools can't give you, a, they can't do a timing analysis for you, and you want them to be able to do a timing analysis to, to see that you've met timing. And by timing analysis, basically what they do is they know that, okay, the, all these flip-flops here are using the same clock. They have timing models. They know what the clock to Q output delays are. They know what the loading is on this signal. They know what the setup time is for the next flip-flop. And they can calculate, you know, and they know the routing, the place and route after you've routed it. They, they can calculate all of that information and make sure that that time from clock to Q plus the um, delay 
across the net due to loading and all that type of stuff, plus the setup time from D to, to, the, to the next clock. They can, they can calculate and make sure that all of those times added together are less than the clock period. Okay? And if they are, then your design meets timing analysis, which is a very good thing. Okay. Well, that was a, that's a subtlety that, uh, that isn't obvious, at least it wasn't to me, so I, I'm glad you mentioned that. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll talk some more about this, but I think I'm running out of time here now. But um, unless you absolutely, you can do this, like you mentioned, I, um, you can do that, but I don't recommend it. Okay. You know, unless you really have to, it's best to stick to running as many flip-flops on the same clock as you can so that the tool can give you a, a timing analysis and you'll know whether your design meets timing based over temperature and voltage and, and all of those type of things. And, and the lot that the FPGA came out of, you know, the silicon lot. Um, it can calculate all of that stuff for you. Okay. And you get into some real messy timings if you, if you do stuff like this. <laughs> okay. So you want to be able, that's one of the things you want to be able to do is meet your timing analysis. So anyway, this DB rise, real quick, is basically I take the, the D1 and and it with the knot of D2. Okay, so let's go back to our little diagram. That would be basically this D1 and it with the knot of D2. And I actually run that back in through another flip-flop so that actually instead of coming out right, right here, it, it comes out one clock delayed right here. But this R is then right out of a flip-flop and not out of the, uh, the AND logic. And that helps for, for uh, meeting some timing thing. You could do it either way, but I, just, I do it this way a lot. So basically all I'm doing is generating a one clock wide pulse. Okay, And now this one clock wide pulse is in sync with our clock and it can be used by other logic uh, running on this same clock. Okay, so that tells me that, okay, I had a, a rising edge there. And so this pulse now will occur every time I have a rising edge, right? I called it DB rise. Mm -hmm. DB rise. I can't write with this. Okay, so DB rise now tells me when the rising edge occurs. So now I go down here, and in my idle state, as soon as I see a rising edge, and I remember reset's finished, and the transmitter is going to transmit a low for quite some time, so I've had plenty of time, you know, no problem in this particular case. Um, so when that first rising edge comes along, I say, oh, hey, I've got a data bit or a sync bit now, and I go to this next state called bit. And then, I don't know if Michael has any more time for this, but uh, we could continue this next time and talk about how it uh, grabs the data. Good. Okay. Okay. All right. I think that's it for today. And like I say, I think we have uh, just two uh, more basic le lectures. Okay, great. Um, the, the next meeting, do you want to meet a little early again as well? Uh, that's up to everybody else. It's well, helping a lot. I, I, I would personally recommend it. Okay, we'll do that then. If that's okay with Michael, we'll meet at 3.30 again. Okay, I'll, I'll schedule it for 3.30. Okay, thanks. Thanks, guys. Bye. Okay, thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye. Okay, good night, all. Good night.